I don't. Number one, you live there. She's my mother. Hello, welcome to the Libertarian and with me uh, to discuss current issues uh, with a libertarian perspective, I have Devin Minima, uh, Dixon City Councilman, and James Just, uh, Vice Chair of the Sacramento Libertarian Party. Uh, Thanks so, for having us. Oh, no problem. <laughs> uh, great to have you. Uh, so, uh, jumping right in with fun and games, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the new board game by Parker Brothers and Hasbro, Miss Monopoly. It's a, a new twist on a relatively old game, uh, but in this twist they actually have uh, different rules for women and men, which is kind of odd. Uh, they Apparently women make a little bit more money when they pass go than men do. Uh, so, uh, James, did you want to talk a little bit about fun and games with Monopoly? Oh, sure, I'll open the can of worms. Uh, well, from a business perspective, they're feeding a certain area of the market, so knock themselves out, right? It doesn't offend me that they want to have a Monopoly game with goofy rules. Okay, fine. I wouldn't play it because, you know, it's not, it's fundamentally, it's an unfair game. And you can understand the point if the point was actually true. But for those of us who work at the as the average person, there's no difference between the average dishwasher, a male or a woman, you know, they both get paid the same. Now, maybe when you talk high up and high end, there may be a difference, even though the data isn't actually clear until you get to the high end CEOs. But I can't bring myself to care a whole lot if, if Hasbro wants to make a goofy game that's only going to be marketed to a handful of, you know, far leftists. What do I care? It's not, you know, it's, I just can't bring myself to care. Well, one of the funny things about it, though, is any game. Uh, just about starts with everybody essentially having the same rules, which is, is kind of odd. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, all these games are geared towards social justice just the way they are. Everybody starts with the same amount of money, the same rules, but they've actually altered the game to give special rules to women, which uh, it, apparently uh, you get 240 bucks as you pass go if you're a woman, and if you're a guy, you get 200 bucks when you pass go. <laughs> so, and, and apparently, there's a lot of extra focus on on uh, uh, women as well in the game. So it, it, just, it, it just seems a little bit odd. I don't know, Devin, did you have any thoughts on it? Well, you know, I was looking at the rules and there are some things about this game that I actually think are really cool and innovative. Like, uh, for example, instead of having different properties, they're having inventions made by women. So you got things like Wi-Fi and uh, all, all kinds of different inventions that you end up landing on. Um, I do think fundamentally though, especially with that, that you know, the bonus pass and go, that it, it's it's not something I'd be comfortable with my future kids playing with. I don't have any yet, but um, it it's, it presents a, an unfairness that, that James was talking about that I'm just not comfortable with, and I don't think that we should be teaching our kids that. Um, you know, we want to teach them fairness, playing by the rules, and and you know, getting ahead by hard work or by good strategy. You know, yeah. so. Well, and it, it seems like it's just uh, winding up, uh, essentially doing what its 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 purpose seems to be to to make women feel empowered. But does it? It almost is is sort of demeaning to say that you need an extra advantage in order to compete, uh, which is kind of what the passing go and getting extra pay seems to seems to be saying. But uh, yeah, exactly. And I just have to look at it from the perspective of. You know, I'm not a I'm not a woman, but uh, I am a minority. So if someone if Parker Brothers were to put out you know minorityopoly, and make it so that okay if you're if you're Asian or Black or Latino or whatever, you get an extra forty bucks. I'd find that very demeaning. So I just have to carry that experience you know forward. That I you know I'd assume that uh, that other people would find this demeaning as well. You know, one of the other things too about Monopoly. Uh, that I, I kind of find a little bit off-putting as well is it seems to be the game that gives people their their first reflections of what capitalism is supposed to be about, and of course it's it's actually set up in a uh, essentially a, uh, a zero-sum game. You know, you only yeah. win if another person loses, and in reality, we know that capitalism as libertarians is is much richer. It's essentially about growing the pie and everybody being. Uh, better off afterwards, and so it just seems like there's so many things with with uh, you know both Monopoly and Miss Monopoly that so many people just seem to seem to be kind of getting wrong in their views of, of how. Well, I, I think we've, we've comes to a point where we've kind of <coughs> lost the point of all these games. The games are meant to, to teach 
general philosophical lessons. They're not meant to, to teach, you know, specific lessons over, over, you know, strange social issues that change every five, six years. But then again, you know, Hasbro's a business and they want to sell some games and they know there's a certain segment of the population who will buy this game simply because it's missing Monopoly with goofy rules and it'll go sit in the top of their, of their bookcase. And no one's going to matter, you know. In five years, no one's going to remember Miss Monopoly. It's not going to be something that's stuck around. It's not going to make a social impact, except we all get to sit around and talk about it for a few minutes. It'll just be one of the many Sacramento Monopoly, San Francisco <laughs> Monopoly, Star Wars Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, they've got all kinds of goofy stuff now. It, it feeds a certain segment of the population who, you know, want to own it for, you know, nostalgia or whatever. They play it once or twice, maybe, and then they stick it on the, you know, on the top of their closet like where all my board games are. Hey, if Dixon had a Monopoly game, then everything's got a Monopoly game at this point, okay? <laughs> Dixonopoly, I still remember playing that. So. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, of, you know, changes in, uh, uh, in the culture and society, like uh, you were mentioning earlier, James, um, recently we've had this trend toward vaping uh, to, to push us mm -hmm. beyond cigarettes, I guess, you know, and the, and the uh, Trump administration just in the last few weeks has put a ban on uh, vaping of uh, flavored e-cigarettes, mm -hmm. I guess. And so, uh, uh, Devon, did, uh, did you want to uh, give us a little more of an update on this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what, one of the things that I, th I think is happening here is that we're, we're moving so fast because of a very limited scare that has occurred, you know, with the with the deaths and, and illnesses that have occurred. Um, but what's being lost in the mix, and you'll hear it sometimes on the news, they'll actually mention it, that the illnesses and deaths have been occurring with home brews and uh, CBD oils, which are not your typical flavored nicotine oil oils or um, glycerin uh, based uh, juices that you're finding in these stores. Now I can say I I know plenty of people who uh, have switched over to vaping instead of smoking cigarettes. They're saving hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars a year, not to mention the health, benefit, you know, the health uh, risks are uh, generally lower with vaping. Well, yeah, because it's, it's still the tar early. that is causing all the problems from the smoking, I guess, the ingestion exactly. of that. And of course, you're eliminating that with the e-cigarettes. Exactly. And I've seen people that have gone from you know, smoking a pack a day down to going to a three milligram juice and, and you know being able to even out with that and and eventually get down to zero nicotine where it's just the habit you know of, of vaping to keep that habit around and that way it goes completely psychological instead of physical so um i th i find it really unfortunate not to mention there are hundreds and hundreds of people that are employed uh thanks to these different smoke shops that have opened up and these juice companies that are out there those are jobs that are going to evaporate if this vaping ban uh, comes out as as stringent as people are thinking it's going to. Um, there's going to be thousands of jobs across the country that will cease to exist. Because the cool part about vaping, uh, or at least that industry, was that it's so decentralized. You don't have Philip Morris controlling the entire industry. You don't have you know these these big tobacco companies weighing in, uh, with the exception of a jewel. You know, um, and that's all going to be lost. In fact, Juul is, which is partially owned by, I think, Philip Morris, uh, or one of the big tobacco companies, is basically set to be the last one standing when this is all said and done because they create tobacco flavored juices and not uh, sweet or other, other than tobacco flavored juices. Hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that is troubling about this compared to, uh, you know, so many of the other things they want to ban is that with the respect to e-cigarettes, it's a path for many smokers to try and get break a bad habit of smoking conventional cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to avoid the harm that's, uh, you know, actually being caused by ingesting that smoke and tar into your lungs. So mm -hmm. it, it just seems so uh, ridiculously... Uh, counterintuitive that the state would then ban a path to get off of the true health, uh, 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 true societal mm -hmm. health impact of, of, of regular cigarettes. In fact, the article I was reading was suggesting that even though patches and uh, uh, other forms of uh, nicotine are ways that some people try, it, it, they don't have that hand to mouth that you were suggesting too, mm -hmm. that the, the vaping would have as well. So there's that psychological impact as well. 
So it just it, it just seems uh, the nanny state run amok. <laughs> well, exactly. we talk about the nanny state, we go actually go back to the more fundamental question is we know prohibition doesn't work. It's been mm -hmm. tried and tried again since biblical times and it, it simply doesn't work. So what does work is education. If you want to stop kids from, from smoking and from starting vaping is you educate them just like you've done with everything else. The, the solution isn't easy. It's not simplistic where you can do it in a day and pat yourself on the back and pretend you did something. It takes 10, 12, 20, 30, 50 years. Mm -hmm. But that's the only way you can actually accomplish these things. We, we know for a fact that prohibition doesn't work. Well, and this is a crazy thing too. My understanding is that these are already illegal for children anyways. It's, yes, it's for exactly. adults, they're able to be used. And so they're banning the flavors because kids would prefer those flavors and it's a path in potentially for them. But that's also what the adults who enjoy them prefer about mm -hmm. them is the flavors. So yes. It's, it's, it's just, kind of pretending adults don't like strawberry flavored vaping <laughs> tasks or, or, you know, kiwi flavored. I think these are the same people who eat, what, uh, avocado toast or whatever that stuff is. <laughs> you know, they're somehow not going to like avocado flavored vaping products or whatever. Come on. It, we, pumpkin spice latte vaping. You know they well. This is... <laughs> this is not, you know, adults like these flavors too. And that's the problem is they assume that these flavors are designed just for kids and they're simply not. Mm -hmm. They're designed because adults want them. It would be interesting too to see if, uh, you know, now that the public has a taste for this vaping, if that's going to draw, uh, drive a black market if you try and mm -hmm. ban these things. I mean, after all you're saying, it's quite decentralized already. Exactly. And one of the, what gets me is in our town in Dixon, we have, we have an underage nicotine problem. Um, and that's one of the things that our, our key club at the local high school has been fighting and they've been partnering up with the high school administration and they've been working really hard on creating awareness about the long-term effects. But I also think it's important not to, you know, jump into the reefer madness scare tactic of, of trying to frighten people. What we're looking at is an enforcement model. Somehow these kids are getting their hands on, on vape juice underage. They're getting their hands on on the actual hardware, you know, uh, both ways. And it's it's we've got to find a way to crack down and enforce on that because that is something that we shouldn't be get uh, you know giving access to kids for. Now I'm not sure if I think it should be 21 um, because if you're going to be an adult at 18, then you should be able to make your own decisions. But under you know, the law is the law right now. So under 21, the state and the local municipalities should be working together to work, work hard and enforce that law. Sure, and it's sort of like why throw yet another law and if you can't even make the law that you have in the first place work. <laughs> exactly. If you're worried about kids vaping, maybe we should try enforcing the law that exists. Yeah, and we have a program. We, we do it with the alcohol, alcohol control. We can send in, you know, they send in kids to test alcohol and other cigarettes. We can do the same thing. You can use the same type of enforcement mm -hmm. that we already have. We already have the tools to, to deal with the problems, <coughs> and we just choose not to because, again, we like to virtue signal. We've got a bunch of politicians and activists who want to go up there and, and think like they're doing something when they're really not. They're just mm -hmm. annoying people's lives, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> getting in everybody's life it's 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 getting annoying yeah well mm. speaking of bands and virtue signaling uh, one of the uh, things that's actually happened uh, now and it's it's surprisingly it's not a government move it's a private industry move but it's the ban of open carry in certain stores uh, so essentially uh, after we've had a, a rash of, of some mass shootings earlier this year Walmart and Kroger, I believe, uh, first uh, made a move to ban open carry in their stores. And, and there were some reasons behind that that they gave right after it happened. Mm -hmm. But now a few other uh, companies are also uh, making that uh, move as well. Walgreens and I guess Wedger, I, I think they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, those, those companies are also uh, calling for a ban of open carry within their stores in states where it's legal to open carry. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Devon, did you, did you want to? Yeah, so uh, this is definitely a case of virtue signaling. Um, for one, if someone's going to walk into a store and, and shoot the place up, I kind of doubt that they're concerned about whether or not you can see or not see their weapon, right? Um, and the interesting thing is, so this can't apply to CCWs because CCWs explicitly allow you to take your gun everywhere, you know? Um, it This is purely meant to help that lady in the grocery store or that guy in the grocery store not feel uncomfortable or triggered when he's walking down the ice cream aisle. The simple fact is, you know, the 
when I go to I go to Arizona, right, every once in a while. And uh, I was at a Starbucks, and I was sitting there, and, and these guys walked in, and they both had, you know, guns on their hips, which is a foreign sight if you're from California. But I felt perfectly safe because I knew that, hey, these guys, they're permitted, they're safe, they're following the law, and now I know that if a bad guy walks in, there's two good guys right over there, you know. Um, so it, that's... What it all comes down to is virtue signaling. And, you know, I don't blame the companies for doing that. There's, if you're just looking at a cost-benefit analysis, you know, having cachet with, with uh, you know, your high-end liberals or, or, you know, your urban areas, you know, fine. That All the more power to you. It's your property. You have the ability to set the rules if you want to. But I do think that in the end, it's just a stunt. Well, you know, one of the uh, things that gives me just a little bit of sympathy for at least Walmart in this case was within a few days of one of the shootings somebody decided to open carry in a Walmart in a different part of the country and so mm -hmm. they were walking through the store and I guess they had their phone out and they were sort of taping around and carrying their weapon they weren't apparently threatening anybody but they were just walking around and I guess it caused a panic in the Walmart and they had to shut it down <laughs> and, and and I I'm not sure if they wound up charging the guy I think this was in Minnesota I think that this happened but uh, so I, I guess I can see that there could be some issues with people in the public not being comfortable with open carry, but does that really, I guess, it, does that, should we be infringing on people's rights to open carry as well? Now, that, that being said, this, this isn't a law, that's just companies deciding to do right. this. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, they're allowed, the companies can decide what they want if they want people to come in. And, you know, the companies are, you know, you you can understand where they're coming from that you know they've got they've got to feed the the whole populace they're a general populace and they're going okay we're going to the, the small percentage of people who actually open carry into our you know it's so small even even in states where it's allowed and where it's relatively common you still only get one two percent at most versus half the country says you know i'd prefer not to see someone walking around with the rifle strapped on their back while i'm shopping for my groceries you know even i, I don't care i'm not afraid of guns but i'd probably not want to see I, and then you got those trolls who go out there and you know deliberately make a kind of make a scene of the stuff that's a whole nother yeah. thing and someone who happens to be a, a, a what like a owns a, a jewelry store or something so he carries around with them and so he go happens to be go to the grocery store on the way home and he just still happens to be on his hip as he go you can understand that mm -hmm. so there's there's these two dynamics that we don't want to talk about but you can understand how a Walmart or a Walgreens just say, you know, I don't want to deal with it. We're just going to say we're just ban open carry in our in our stores, and we're just not going to mess with it because that'll die down faster than if we let it. Perhaps it'll be something where it'll be a competition-driven issue where you know maybe some stores will gain some popularity because of their choices, and some will gain popularity because they decide to allow open carry, and they'll just wind yeah. up <laughs> developing different markets. Maybe yeah. yeah, it'll just. I think it only matters in so small areas. You know, there's a handful of areas in Arizona, maybe a couple of areas in Texas, mm -hmm. some places in New Mexico where it actually makes a difference. For most of the country, it's it's not going to change anybody's life. No one's going to say, I'm not going to go to the store because it has open carry. I'm not going to go to the store because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You just go to the store because that's where the store you buy your milk at. That's just kind of what, you know, people people will go back to everyday life relatively quickly simply because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. This does raise the uh, issue, though, if, if people have a large concern over shootings in stores, though, if, if they know that some stores will have more people who you know, are good guys with guns if maybe they mm -hmm. happen to decide that that's a safer place to do their business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, speaking of private companies and making decisions about, uh, you know, who, what to ban, uh, there, there was a case a few months ago in an outback steakhouse where a, uh, a, a family came in and they had a disabled child and the child was making a lot of noise and so some of the customers, I guess, were uncomfortable with uh, the amount of noise that was being generated. And so they had asked the uh, manager at the restaurant to uh, ask the people to leave. And so they did. And that uh, you know, made the uh, family very uncomfortable that had the disabled child. I, you know, and, and it really raises the question, for libertarians, what is the right answer for this? When you have these potentially ADA issues, should, you know, uh, you know what, what would a libertarian do uh, in this case, James? Well, from a libertarian family perspective, you would hope that fellow libertarians would be compassionate to a, to a family and would just kind of ignore the 
you know, the commotion and go about, about, about your life. You know, have your dinner or your lunch and let the, you know, the family deal and, you know, they're having a hard enough time. Don't make it worse for them from a libertarian perspective. Now, from the business owner's perspective, you're kind of stuck, right? It's kind of like, you know, crying baby on an airplane. What the heck do you do? You, you don't know. Now, I've raised an autistic child, and so when he was young, he would just kind of cry and scream, but what our solution to that was we didn't go out, you know? Mm-hmm. And so is, how can you tell a family that has an autistic child you can never go to Denny's when you're on, you know, on the way home from grandma's house? I don't know. You know, it's a hard, that's a hard choice to make, and there's no mm-hmm. easy answer that we can just say, well, here's a universal answer. I think we have to be more... That was the word I'm looking for. We have to be more careful with how we approach these things. Um, maybe there is another solution. Maybe they could have asked the family to move to a back room. Maybe they could have moved the people who to who would complain to a different room, given them a discount, or you know, who knows what they didn't do or what they did do without knowing too much about the situation. I just think more compassion from everybody's sake is what we are kind of our culture needs right now. Mm-hmm. Sure. It also seems too that. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a fallacy to put this on the business itself because the business is a slave to their other customers as well. And if they think that they're serving the needs of the other customers when they ask the family to leave, they, it really puts the, the business as sort of trying to figure out how to please everybody. In this case, they chose one side over the other, and then that made uh, you know some some news. I guess. Yeah, and it's 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 how do you know which side is going to be more upset? Are you going to have families? You know, if you're a family-oriented business, you know you probably cater to the family. If you're a if you're a business that caters to singles, you maybe lean toward more towards the singles or to the the people without families. Mm-hmm. So there's, but there are a restaurant. What was it again? Uh, I have out Outback Outback Steakhouse. See, that's kind of a family restaurant. It's kind of loud there anyway. So I'm not entirely sure what <laughs> what yeah. the complaint is. So. Well, and oftentimes in these cases, too, we, we just hear about the aftermath, and it's really hard to know unless you were there at the time or somebody took right. a video. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we don't have that this time. Well, and isn't that every every business owner's nightmare is that someone's going to yeah. take a video? Now, and this is a situation where there there really isn't a, a, a clear-cut you know way that it should have gone. This is a completely tough situation. What I have noticed is that because issues like this and issues around people with disabilities have become such a a landmine uh, type of issue for people to talk about that there isn't education going on about how to be more sensitive to those issues because we're also convoluting the idea of 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 uh, uniqueness and and different uh, you know levels of capability we're mixing that in with you know people who have anxiety and want to have bring their their animal onto an airplane, you know, things like that that aren't on the same level. Um, And so you don't see that that push for awareness happening in schools and when we're educating our young people. And that means that we're not going to have people that are as compassionate when they're out in the world because they don't know how to identify. You know, they might might be thinking that this kid's just a a, a brat or something like that, you know, and that's not the case at all if they have... Uh, you know, some kind of disability. So it, it's unfortunate that that kind of uh, wet blanket has been thrown on the entire issue, and it's hard for people to talk about that uh, openly and create that sort of awareness so that people can be more compassionate. Well, you know, in the end, too, in a free market, this is where it, it leaves an opening for entrepreneurs to, to try and come in and if there's a significant portion of society that is being underserved or mal-served by uh, by a business, then that opens the door to other businesses. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a there's a business in Seattle. I think they have like a cat coffee shop or something where there's like 100 cats or whatever floating around the coffee shop. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> so people, yeah, but, but for people who like cats who want to come in and sit down, they sit there and they have them, they go and they sit down and have a cup of coffee with cats. Most of us wouldn't like it, but you know, it's a thriving business because it fits one little tiny segment of the of the population and in a place like Seattle it works. Well, imagine if there was a rule or no rule. Uh, yeah, you know, you get no rule and everybody can find what works for them. You get a rule and, and in the end somebody's going to be a little bit dissatisfied with how that goes. 
I can't imagine what the coffee tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's about the coffee. So, you know, <laughs> it's probably folders in your cup. And, you know, they just, it's about, they like the people like to sit around and have, mm-hmm. like, cats. You know, it's the cat people. They, they are what they are. And I have Good no problems it. with people catering to them. Knock themselves out. Enjoy your life. You know, that's kind of my theory. Go out and have some fun. Well, speaking of, of tough issues with kids, and this, this brings us back into the government realm a little bit, but uh, a few months ago there was a case of a, uh, a family uh, who had a child that had leukemia, and they were uh, prescribed to have uh, chemotherapy, and the parents didn't want to. They wanted to treat it with cannabis and some other uh, methods that were, uh, you know, what they felt were appropriate. And so when they didn't show up for their prescribed uh, appointment, you know, uh, eventually the government decided to take the child away from the parents. And so the, the, uh, in order to make sure that the child got his uh, uh, chemotherapy. And so it, this really brings up the question is, for libertarians, when is it appropriate for the state to step in with children? And I, James, I guess I'll start with you on well, that. These, um these child care issues with the state is very difficult because you're you're busting in on it's not just you because you know we all have the right if I want to just decline chemotherapy then I'm kind of can decline chemotherapy but a seven year old can't make that choice mm-hmm. and well I don't want to say the government should ever step in and take it in but there, and take a child so they can force a medical treatment on it there are times when you you know you feel God you really should and so <laughs> and so. It's a, it's a really yeah. tough call. You don't want to make a blanket statement that the government should never come in and take a child in a case where the medical treatment is necessary. But sometimes, like a chemo, it's, or it's, a, it's a long shot. It's a one in a million shot. They're going to go through chemo and all the horrors that come along with it, and the child's going to end up dying anyway. And so mm-hmm. you should be allowed to make the choice with, you know, we want to have what time we have left, we want it to be as high quality as possible so we're not going to go through chemo. Or we're going to try and, and do what we want and roll the dice and you know and and pray for the best mm-hmm. parents and you should be allowed to make that choice now in this particular case i didn't get a chance to to follow this particular case but i'm always reluctant to say the government should be taking children it should mm-hmm. be the only the most extreme cases because the government isn't very good at it yeah absolutely right. and you wonder if you know it's, it's always a trade-off of who really has the best interest of the child the state or the parent but at this point i think we may have to leave it at that uh Uh, Thank you for joining us for the uh, Libertarian Counterpoint. Um, You can uh, uh, thank you for joining us for the Libertarian Counterpoint. You can find us uh, at uh, Sacramento uh, Public Access Channel 17, um, and you can also uh, Google us on YouTube. Thank you. My state stepping in. It's difficult. Yeah.